And we have now to uh, pass to our follow <coughs> to next speaker. And though I am convinced that uh, our next speaker does not need any presentation at all, I am delighted to introduce Adela Yarbrough Collins. She is a Buckingham Professor Emerita of New Testament Criticism and Interpretation at Yale Divinity School. It is not the first time that Professor Collins visits the Biblicum. In the academic year 2015-2016, she was here together with her husband, Professor John Collins, as one of our visiting professors. And he, I remember he gave a course on the Passion Narrative in Mark and also participated on a, on a round table uh, discussion on the topic Women and the Bible. I remember that was a very uh, nice uh, meeting that we have some biblical, women biblical scholars. She has published extensively on the New Testament, especially on the Gospel of Mark and the Book of Revelation. And this afternoon, she will focus on Matthew 23 and the polemic against the Pharisees. Over to you, Professor Palmer. Thank you. <laughs> Have I got the microphone in a good place? Good, thank you. Uh, first, quickly, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Sievers for envisioning this wonderful and engaging conference and to Dean uh, Peter Dubovsky for agreeing to host and also to uh, Joe for letting me speak about Matthew and instead of Mark. I needed a break from Mark. A number of scholars have argued that the evangelist and the addressees of the Gospel of Matthew were Torah observant Jews and that they were still part of the larger Jewish community even though other Jews viewed them as marginal or deviant. Scholars have also argued that the harshness of the polemic in Matthew is best explained as analogous to the intra-Jewish sectarian polemic known from the Dead Sea Scrolls. The greatest difficulty for this position is the application of the parable of the wicked tenants. It is addressed to the chief priests and the elders of the people. Jesus asks his audience, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They reply, he will put those evildoers to a miserable death and leave the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce in its season. Jesus then comments, for this reason, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a people or nation, ethnos, that will bear its fruit. The phrase kingdom of God here refers to the royal reign of God. The removal of this royal reign from the current leaders in Jerusalem means that they will no longer be the authoritative agents of God. I agree with those who argue that the author of Matthew almost certainly refers to his own group as the ethnos that produces the fruit of the kingdom. I disagree, however, with those who conclude that the term here means a voluntary association or small social group. The term is used in some papyri in that way, but in each case the con context makes abundantly clear that that meaning is intended. There is no such content context in Matthew, at least not in proximity to this parable. The transfer of leadership to a people in Matthew and not to specific leaders comparable to the chief priests and the elders, probably is due to Matthew's view of authority as communal rather than hierarchical. The audience of Matthew is not to have official rabbis, teachers, sages in the wisdom tradition, the father who teaches his children, nor instructors. Neither Peter nor his presumed delegates play an official role in the local communities. If someone refuses to repent, those wronged are to report the situation to the assembly, the ecclesia, which exercises the authority of Jesus. Since according to the allegorical reading of the parable of the tenants, this transfer of leadership takes place after Jesus' death, it is appropriate to think of this people as a combination of Jews and Gentiles. Matthew implies that the mission of Jesus and his disciples during his lifetime is directed to the people of Israel alone. 
the healing of the centurion's servant and the exorcism of the Canaanite woman, uh, Canaanite woman's daughter are exceptions. When the risen Jesus appears to his disciples, however, he directs them to make disciples of all nations and to baptize them. He does not speak about them becoming proselytes. Rather, the disciples should teach the nations everything that Jesus had commanded them. There is tension between this reference to a people in the conclusion um, to the parable of the tenants and the mission of all nations that the risen Jesus commands on the one hand and the teaching on the law in the Sermon on the Mount on the other. In the Sermon on the Mount, the Matthean Jesus says, do not think that I have come to put an end to the law or the prophets. I did not come to demolish but to fulfill. Truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not a single letter or part of a letter of the law will pass away until everything has taken place. Therefore, whoever does away with one of the least of these commands and teaches people so will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you surely will not enter the kingdom of heaven. David Sim infers from this passage that all members of the Matthean community were obligated to observe, quote, the whole Torah without qualification, unquote. Andrew Overman and Anthony Saldarini, however, rightly point out that this passage applies to the law as interpreted by Jesus. I suggest that a way forward lies in a reconsideration of the audience and purpose of Matthew. Instead of thinking of Matthew's audience as a messianic Jewish community that is the sole intended audience of the gospel, it may be more accurate and also more fruitful to envision his audience as including followers of Jesus of various kinds. At one end of the spectrum, we may place those who observe the law in a way that includes circumcision, tithing practices, even of vegetables and herbs, the various kosher and purity regulations, and strict Sabbath observance. At the other end of the spectrum are those who observe it in a primarily ethical way. At a point closer to the strict observers are those who observe only circumcision, Sabbath, new moons, and the festivals, as Paul's Galatian rivals apparently proposed. At another point, closer to the ethical type, are those who add Sabbath observance to the ethical interpretation of the law. From this point of view, the strong affirmation of the whole law in 517 to 20 may be seen as a captatio benevolentiae directed to the strict observers of the law. Matthew grants that the authority of Jesus supports their point of view. In the antitheses that follow, however, Jesus gives an interpretation of the righteousness that exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees that is primarily ethical. Only the antithesis involving oaths has a corresponding tractate in the Mishnah. This ethical interpretation of the law reassures those so inclined that the authority of Jesus also supports their way of observing the law. This even-handed rhetoric appeals to a mixed local group of communities, promotes unity, and opens up the relevance of this gospel to the diverse congregations of the movement as a whole. So after these introductory remarks, I turn to the rhetoric and polemic in Matthew 23. From the point of view of ancient rhetoric, the speech in Matthew 23, 13 to 36, belongs to the epideictic mode which expresses praise or blame. The genre encomium expresses praise, while invective, psogos, or denunciation, vituperato, expresses blame. A characterization of the scribes and the Pharisees introduces this speech of reproof. Jesus affirms that they are heirs to the authority of Moses. Therefore, the audience is told to do and keep everything they say to you. A criticism follows immediately, but do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they teach. 
The affirmation of their teaching authority may be read as a validation of the strict observers of the law that at the same time undermines the authority of the rival teachers. The following verse elaborates on the criticism of the scribes and the Pharisees. They tie up heavy loads and place them on people's shoulders, but they themselves do not wish to lift a finger to move them. This statement might not have discouraged the strictly observant, but those who take the ethical approach might not have um, might have recalled another saying of Jesus in Matthew. Come to me, all you who are, who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take up my yoke upon you and learn from me, because I am considerate and humble of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Building on the work of a few other scholars, Menachem Kister has shown that the formula repeated in Matthew 23, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you, etc., is a formula used for introducing sectarian polemic at the time of Jesus, similar to the formula used for intersectarian polemic in the Mishnah. The Mishnaic formula is, we cry out against you, Pharisees, for you, etc. The passages in question are criticisms attributed to the Sadducees, to which replies are given, attributed to the Pharisees. Kister also argues that a passage in the Babylonian Talmud preserves an authentic mode of address that already existed in the late Second Temple period. The formula in this case is, woe to you, wicked ones who maintain, etc. Turning now to the woe sayings in Matthew 23. Since the first two woe sayings do not concern halakhic matters, Kister concludes that the formula in these cases does not introduce sectarian debates, but rather is similar to the prophetic woe sayings in the Hebrew Bible, especially in the prophets, and to those of First Enoch, especially in the epistle, the last part. The first two woe sayings should be taken as a unit the blocking of the entrance to the kingdom of heaven and the condemnation of proselytes to the Pharisaic point of view are both due to their faulty teaching. The third woe may be defined as halakhic. Here the scribes and Pharisees are addressed polemically as blind guides. The repeated references to swearing give the impression that the topic is oaths. Oaths, however, were avoided at this time because they involved God's name. And in the words of the Decalogue, the Lord will not acquit him who takes his name in vain. The passage actually refers indirectly to prohibitive vows. These are dedicatory vows. And he who violates a prohibitive vow actually commits trespass with regard to temple property. The distinctive character of the prohibitive vow is that there is no intention to actually make an offering. Rather, it bars the votary or another person named in the vow from deriving benefit from a particular possession. The trespass only occurs if and when an individual named in the vow makes use of the banned property. In the time after the destruction of the temple, the prohibitive vow formula was changed so that its key term, korban, or konam, was understood to mean like an offering. This new understanding was legitimated as part of Torah law by arguing that in Numbers 30, the vow to the Lord is not an ordinary biblical vow, but a vow likening an object to the temple offerings and thus placing it under a ban. Examples from the Mishnaic tractate Nedarim are, if he said, may it be to me as the lamb, that is the whole burnt offering, or as the temple sheds of Ezekiel 46, or as the wood for burning on the altar, or as the fire offerings of Leviticus 21, or as the altar, or as Jerusalem, or if he vowed by any of the utensils of the altar of Exodus 27, although he did not utter the word korban, an offering, 
It is a vow as binding as if he had uttered the word korban. This then is the likely context in which the second unit of the woe sayings of the Mathean Jesus ought to be understood, which reads, woe to you blind guides who say, if someone swears by the temple, it is nothing, that is the oath is invalid. But if someone swears by the gold of the temple, he is bound by the oath. You are foolish and blind leaders, for which is greater, the gold or the temple that consecrates the gold? Furthermore, you say, if someone swears by the altar, it is nothing. But if someone swears by the offering on the altar, he is bound by the oath. You are blind people, for which is greater, the offering or the altar that consecrates the offering? Therefore, the one who swears by the altar swears by it and by all the offerings on it. And the one who swears by the temple swears by it and by the one who dwells in it. And the one who swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and the one who sits on it. A key step, I think, in interpreting this passage is to recognize that the Mathean Jesus is talking about oaths, but referring to the current policy of the successors to the Pharisees concerning prohibitive vows. Moshe Benowitz argues plausibly that the predecessors of the rabbis accepted the consecration formula, the gold that I use is dedicated to the temple, and rejected oaths by the altar or the temple because they use substitutes for the divine name. But for Jesus, as for Josephus, Philo, and the Jewish populace in general, the terms used for the prohibitive vow were actually oath formulas. To the Mathean Jesus, the rabbis seemed inconsistent in what they declared valid and invalid. Benowitz concludes that Jesus objects to the very institution of prohibitive vows, which in his view makes a mockery of the consecration formula. That could be the case, but another way of looking at this passage is to argue that the Mathean Jesus calls for a return to the plain meaning of the Torah law, which treats oaths rather extensively and does not mention prohibitive vows. He claims that all oaths, including their equivalents, are valid only because the key terms rest upon the holiness of the one enthroned in heaven. In this passage, the Mathean Jesus seems to advocate oaths by more acceptable substitutes for the name of God than those used by prohibitive vows. The audience of Matthew, however, will recall his teaching on oaths in the Sermon on the Mount. In that passage, the danger of swearing by the great king is addressed by the command, do not swear at all, but let your word be yes, yes, or no, no. Whatever goes beyond this comes from the evil one. As Kister has shown, the fourth woe saying leads the audience to think that the point at issue is halakhic. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin. But instead of then pursuing halakhic issues, the Mathean Jesus shifts to an ethical topic and have abandoned what is more important in the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you should have done without neglecting the others. It is not necessary, as some have argued, to assume here that that Matthew is advocating that all members of his audience um, teach, um, that all members of his audience tithe herbs like these. The polemical point being made is that the successors of the scribes and Pharisees in Matthew's time do not practice what they teach. Fine, tithe herbs if you like, but don't forget these other things. The obligation of tithing herbs was disputed in the late Tanaitic period on the grounds that it is not found in the Torah. If such disputes were already current in the time of Matthew, the tithing of herbs would have had relatively minor halakhic significance. The conclusion of this unit reads, you are blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Straining out gnats relates to a known halakhic practice. The Damascus document may already affirm it. 
uh, it reads, no one should defile his soul with any living or creeping animal by eating them. From the larvae of bees to every living being that creeps in water. This practice may have been disputed already in the time of Matthew. Kister has shown that according to rabbinic literature, drinking wine with gnats was not a transgression of the law because such gnats were allegedly produced by the wine in the wine or from the wine by spontaneous generation and therefore part of the wine. In fact, Rabbi Judah claimed that straining out gnats before drinking is forbidden and those who do it are heretics. The hyperbolic reference to swallowing a camel expresses a contrast between one of the smallest creatures and one of the largest. The function of the contrast here is, of course, to illustrate the accusation of observing minor matters and neglecting major ones. Compensating for a polemical exaggeration, one could take the contrast as challenging the priorities set by the scribes and Pharisees. The evangelist creates a similar shift in the fifth woe saying. The first part, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you make clean the outside of the cup and of the dish. That opening sets the audience up to expect a halakhic discussion. Kister has suggested that the most relevant context for this issue is a difference of opinion between the house of Shammai and the house of Hillel two leading schools of thought active in the first centuries BCE and CE. The house of Shammai tried to keep the outside of the utensil pure, whereas the house of Hillel assumed that the outside of a cup is always deemed defiled. The Matthean saying continues, however, with the mark, remark, but inside they are full of plunder and intemperance. You blind Pharisee, first make clean the inside of the cup so that the outside of it may also be clean. The shift takes place with the idea that the contents, the inside of the cup and the plate, are immoral rather than ritually unclean. The use of the word plunder, harpage, suggests that the drink or food is ill-gotten, seized, stolen, or acquired in a way disadvantageous to those who produced it. The term intemperance, or more generally, lack of self-control, acrasia, suggests gluttony and drunkenness. These are the vices of those who do not aspire to self-mastery or who have not yet achieved it. The concluding direct address to an individual Pharisee completes the shift to moral issues and expresses one of the classic meanings of a hypocrite one who appears to be virtuous, but is not actually so. This type of stock polemic is most often applied to the wealthy by the poor whom they exploit. The sixth and last of the shorter woe sayings makes no gesture toward halakhic discussion, but vilifies the scribes and Pharisees with a classic illustration, or at least it has become classic. You know, Shakespeare is full of cliches. Um, a classic illustration of hypocrisy, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which are beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead bones and every kind of uncleanness. So also you on the outside appear to be righteous people, but on the inside are full of hypo hypocrisy and lawlessness. The apparently redundant hypocrisy with which the leaders are accused of being filled argues a point made in the introduction they do not practice what they teach. And this failure to practice is equivalent to lawlessness. The seventh and last woe is the longest and functions as an announcement of judgment. It begins with the usual polemical address, but ends with the judgment predicted upon this generation, so more broadly than the Pharisees and the scribes. The point of the first six verses has been well stated by Douglas Hare. Those addressed are accused of manifesting the same negative attitude toward contemporary prophecy as those who killed the prophets of earlier ages and therefore are to be regarded as the spiritual children of the prophet slayers, even though they profess respect for the murdered prophets by constructing elaborate memorials. However, in her 2001 
unfortunately unpublished dissertation, Colleen Stamos argued that the theme of the killing of the prophets is an invention of early followers of Jesus. The only attestation of the actual killing of prophets in the Bible is Nehemiah 9.26 in the communal confession led by Ezra. Nevertheless, they were disobedient and rebelled against you and cast your law behind their backs and killed your prophets who had warned them in order to turn them back to you. So this is a, a clear exaggeration of what we actually find in the narratives of the, of the Hebrew Bible. Matthew 23, 34 makes clear that the rivals represented by the scribes and Pharisees are being accused of persecuting the leaders of the followers of Jesus, who are called prophets, sages, and scribes. The Matthean Jesus states that he will send such leaders in a saying adapted from the synoptic saying source, Q for short, in which personified wisdom is the one who will send prophets and apostles, some of whom the addressees will kill and persecute. In Matthew's version of the saying, they will kill and crucify some of them. Since there is no evidence of any kind that early followers of Jesus in the first century at least were crucified, the allusion is probably to the crucifixion of Jesus, implying that the same fate awaits his followers, as in Mark, take up your cross and follow me. The better evidence for the social context of Matthew is the second part of verse 34, and some of them you will flog and pursue, pursue from city to city. The flogging may be related to the punishment of flogging specified in Deuteronomy 25 and discussed in the Mishnah tractate Makoth, stripes. Paul, for example, states, five times I received the 40 strokes, less one from the Jews. So it may be that the evangelist knew of followers of Jesus who had received this punishment. The passage opens out on a broader horizon with the following verse, so that may come upon you all the innocent blood shed upon the earth from the blood of the innocent Abel up to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you killed between the temple and the altar. The conclusion of the speech reads, truly I say to you, all this will come upon this generation. The term this generation refers to the contemporaries of John the Baptist, Jesus, and his very early followers. It is not stated in this context what the punishment will be. In the parable of the king who gave a wedding banquet for his son, however, the king punishes those who killed the slaves he sent to them by destroying them and burning their city. The lament of Jesus over Jerusalem that follows the woe sayings supports this inference that the destruction of the city is the punishment implied here. Conclusion. As we have seen, it is likely that the scribes and Pharisees in Matthew 23 represent the leaders of Jewish communities with whom the evangelist and his fellow leaders competed for power and influence. It also seems likely that over the centuries, Christian readers and auditors of this passage connected its scribes and Pharisees with the Jews of their own times and cultures. Furthermore, not surprisingly, such perceptions of this text probably instilled considerable prejudice against Jews among many who read or heard it. So what should Christians do who have such a vitriolic, um, dangerous text at the heart of uh, the canon. Given the situation, I think it is appropriate to cast some blame upon Matthew and also upon later teachers and preachers uh, for not um, dealing with this uh, text better. But some blame I think Matthew deserves for some of the same reasons that he blamed his rivals. For example, in writing this passage, the evangelist did not practice what he taught elsewhere in his work. He transmits as authoritative the teaching of Jesus. Whoever says fool is liable to fiery Gehenna. At the same time, he calls his rivals fools in the third woe saying. This teaching of Jesus applies just as well to the evangelist's use of epithets like hypocrites, blind, snakes, and offspring of vipers. 
Furthermore, the teaching of Jesus on not returning evil for evil does not seem compatible with the last woe. The announcement of harsh judgment upon those who persecute the followers of Jesus, even if it were all true that they were persecuting them, the announcement of this harsh judgment is not compatible with that saying. It is even less compatible with the teaching, I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. The teaching of the Sermon on the Mount is notoriously difficult to observe. It is nevertheless a call to a high standard to which Christians should aspire. Thank you. <laughs>